You are listening to Setting History Straight with Linda Watson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show. Today, we're going to cover the prophecy of the northern tribes. Now, the prophecy for the southern tribes we're going to talk about at another point. That is covered in the book of Joel, especially Joel chapter 3. And it also includes parts of Daniel, Daniel 11. So tonight, we're going to talk specifically about the northern tribes. The northern tribes we usually call the ten tribes of Israel or Ephraim. So what is in store for these tribes? And that's what we want to talk about. Now, let's start by talking about what has happened in the past. Now, prophecy is is something that cycles around, and it continues to repeat itself. And we find that in Ecclesiastes 3.15, it tells you that history repeats itself, and God designed it to work that way. So if the northern ten tribes are taken and go into captivity again, then they will have to go into captivity by a country that's playing the role of Assyria. Because the northern ten tribes were originally taken down in 721 B.C. from the land of Assyria. Now, the southern tribes, which were Judah, they were taken down by Babylon. So there was two different actual kingdoms that took down the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And that's a very important point to make when we're talking about prophecy because it may be that two different kingdoms will take down the two different tribes. Now, who are these northern tribes today? And that's the real question. And when we read Genesis 49, it, it tells a story of Jacob calling his 12 sons together. And he says, I'm going to tell you who you're going to be in the last days. So the 12 tribes are going to be around at the last days, according to Genesis 49. And the book of Revelations also tells you that there's 12,000 from each one of the tribes of Israel that make up a group in the book of Revelations called the 144,000. There's been much speculation about that, but it's definitely these descendants of these people. And no matter how you try to read it differently, it's talking about a physical group of people. Now, it's very easy to trace the origin of these people from the area that they settled when they came into captivity the first time, which was the area above the Black Sea called the Ukraine. There is much archaeological evidence showing the tombstones of these people how they recorded that they were the 12 tribes and they had came out of exile from the land of Israel and Cana. They migrated into Europe and became the Germanic tribes that settled Western Europe and they would eventually move themselves into Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Iceland, Scotland, the Scandinavian countries, and many other places. We know where those dramatic people went. There's no doubt about where they went. Once they came into Western Europe during the 2nd and 3rd century, the record of where they went is well defined. Now, don't forget that the historian Josephus also tells us who the 12 tribes were and where they were. Now, remember, Josephus wrote during the first century, and he may have been a small child at the time the Messiah was in the land of Cana. And he plainly states in his writings that they were the people across Euphrates River. And the people that lived across the Euphrates River were called the Parthians. Now, in history, we know that the Parthians came to live in that land out of the land of Scythia. That's well documented by the historians that wrote the history of both Parthia and Scythia. That George Rollison wrote the history of Parthia, and he explained how they were kinsmen to the Scythians. The Scythians were the people above the Black Sea. Now, Parthians stayed in that area, which basically is the area of Asia Minor, clear into Central Asia. They were a huge kingdom of people. And they would fall around 247 B.C. 
and then they moved themselves up into the area of Scythia and eventually those people in Scythia would move themselves into Germany and then down into the area we refer to as Western Europe. Now our ancestors for many years understood that they were the descendants of Israel. Robert the Bruce and the people of Scotland when they received their independence from Britain, wrote their own declaration of independence. It's called the Abroth. In that document, they record that their ancestors crossed across the Red Sea. They admitted that their ancestors were the Israelites. And this is the Scottish people. So there's much proof that shows that we are Israel. Now, on my website, 12tribehistory.com, please go out. I've got many programs out there and on the YouTube that show and prove that the Christian nations are those 12 tribes of Israel's descendants. Now, this includes Judah, who is in the land of Israel right now. Now, I believe that Ezekiel 38 is talking specifically to the, the nations of Israel and the 10 tribes. So let's go to Ezekiel 38 and let's take a look at what it actually says. I do not think it applies to the tribe of Judah. I think the tribe of Judah is taken down by the country called Babylon or a country that's playing the role of Babylon. So let's start in verse 1, Ezekiel 38, And the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog the chief priest Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, if you have heard my program on the prophecy of Gog and Magog, and it's actually uh, the history, and in that program, I go through and show you without a doubt that Gog is the country that we call Russia today. Now, if you have not heard that program, please go out to my website, 12tribehistory.com and look for that program and play it because I, I take an entire program to prove that Gog is Russia. But Russia is not the only country that we're talking about when we are talking about this particular prophecy. Now this is the two nations of Meshach and Tubal and they would be of the sons of Japheth. But they're not the only ones that are involved in this prophecy. Let's look at verse 5, and it says, Persia, which would be Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, with them, all of them with shields of helmets. Okay, so those countries also are going to come against this land of Israel, this, these ten tribes. And that would be in, including some of the African tribes that would be including Libya, and if you look in verse 6, it also mentions here Gomer. Gomer, I believe, is Korea. And all his bands in the house of Togoma in the northern quarter. Now, Togoma was always the Mongolians. So that would include China. So these are the people that are involved in this prophecy. We have Russia. We have China. We have Korea. We have Iran. We have Ethiopia. And we had Olivia. So now let's read on here. Now verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. And is gathered out of many nations against the mountain of Israel. Now many people believe that this is talking about a battle that occurs during the time of the millennium. But I do not think that's what it's referencing at all. I don't think that's what it's talking about here. I think it says many days, and that's talking about a long length of time after Israel had come out of captivity. The first time. It's talking about her first captivity that occurred in 721 B.C. It says many days. And it's giving you a time frame here. It says the latter times or the latter days. Now, usually when that refers to the latter days, that is at least the last two or three centuries before the coming of the Messiah. The latter days absolutely means before the Messiah returns. 
That's what it's talking about, the latter days. So it's giving you a time setting. It's saying that it's in the latter days. And it says that they come against the mountains of Israel. Now that is referring to the governments of Israel. So it's not just one country that's being brought down here. It's all the governments of Israel is what it's talking about here. Now, does that include Judah? I believe that Judah is, is taken down by a country that's playing the role of Babylon. It says it goes against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So they're brought out of the nations. It's talking about a time that they are in a place that they are residing and they are safe. Okay, so now let's pick up in verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Now that is a mouthful because he's telling you here that Gog and this group that's coming with her, these nations that are coming with her, they are coming against Israel that is unwalled. And it says all of her cities do not have walls. Now that's telling you right off the bat that Messiah, the Heavenly Father, is trying to reveal to you at this point that it's Israel that has no walls. Now that cannot be describing the Middle East because the Israel, the land of Israel in the Middle East, Jerusalem has walls. So it's not describing the Israel in the Middle East. It specifically tells you this Israel that it's referring to, none of its cities have walls. So this is not talking about Jerusalem. This is not talking about the Middle East. It can't be. And it says another very interesting thing. It says, and they dwell safely. So these people are not at war at this point. When God comes in, these, this country is not at war, or these countries are not at war. They're dwelling safely. Now, that's another proof that it's not talking about the Middle East, because the land of Israel, you cannot say that they dwell safely right now. They are not dwelling safely. So this prophecy is not for them, and that's what I want to emphasize here. It's for a Israel that has unwalled cities, and that is the 10 tribes of Israel. That would include the European countries, Australia, Ireland, and many of the other Christian nations. That They make up the lost 10 tribes of Israel. Now let's read verse 12. And, and to take a spoil and to take prey and to turn every hand upon desolate places that are are now uninhabited and upon people that are gathered out of the nations that have gone, gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Now pick up on verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus said the Lord God, in that day when my people Israel dwell safely, shall thou know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the northern parts. Now this is another proof that this is Russia and China because they come out of the northern part of the world. Now, if you draw a line straight up from the Middle East, you're going to get you're going to be in either northern Europe or in Russia. So it's very simple to be able to see who this is. Now, going on, and it says, and thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and great company and a mighty army. So they're bringing machinery. They're bringing military weapons in verse 16 and they shall come up against my people israel as a cloud that covers the land and it will shall be in the latter days and i will bring thee against my land so he's calling these people israel and he's calling them his land and that the heathen may know when i shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now verse 18, And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, said the Lord, My fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in my 
fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So we're talking about when these people come into the land, they're going to look like a cloud. There's so many of them. And they're going to come in and, and the Heavenly Father is going to be so outraged that he's going to shake the earth with an earthquake. Now they're going to come in and they're going to spoil the land. And now we're going to turn to some more verses to show this. Let's turn to Zechariah and we're going to use Zechariah chapter 2. And we're going to pick up on verse 4. Chapter 2 verse 4. And, it, and said unto him, Run, speak to the young men, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. So he's talking about Jerusalem symbolically, and it's representing Jerusalem without walls. So it's another way of saying Israel. It's, it's the land of Israel without walls. So he's just repeating what was mentioned in Ezekiel 38 here. Now let's go on. And it says, For I, said the Lord, will be unto thee a wall of fire around about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. So verse 6, Ho, ho, come forth, flee from the land of the north, said the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as four wings of heaven, said the Lord. Now that's when the scattering takes place. That's when many scriptures that talk about Israel is going to be scattered and sifted to all nations. This is her second captivity. That's when she has her scattering. Right now, she's in nations that are in Genesis 49. It talks about her being in nations. She's actually in nations. She's not in a scattered state. But when she goes into captivity, she will be. Now, verse 7. Deliver thyself, O Zion. That's another name for Israel that dwells with the daughter of Babylon. Okay, so now it's telling you that if you are in the land or the daughter of Babylon, Babylon would have been the descendants of Babylon. So that's not referring to Babylon in the Middle East. It's the descendants or the people that are symbolically representing Babylon. Now, if you go back and read Jeremiah 51 and you read Isaiah 47, you read about this woman who is called the daughter of Babylon. And it says she sits as a queen. She doesn't think she can fall, and she's the hammer of the earth. So many people today view this, those scriptures in reference to America and maybe other Israelite nations because they don't think they could fall, and they truly are the hammer of the earth, especially America. So it says, deliver thyself. That means don't sit there and wait for somebody to come and get you. It says, deliver yourself, O Zion, that dwells in the daughter of Babylon. Verse 8, for thus said the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto a nation which spoil you. So this nation is coming in to take your goods, and it's coming to take you into captivity. They're coming to spoil you. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now that is what he's calling his people. His people are the apple of his eye. He said, so if they touch you, they're touching the apple of my eye. Verse 9, for behold, I will shake my hand unto them, and they shall be spoiled to their servants. And you shall know that the Lord God of hosts has sent me. Now again, notice the time setting, and it says, now this punishment in this captivity is going to occur basically because she has left her religious roots, and she has left the covenant of her ancestors that was made back in Exodus 21, 22, and 23. And she doesn't know it, but she has left her covenant. She has lost her identity. And at this point, all of this is going to come rushing back to her. Now let's go to Zechariah 13, and we're going to start in verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, said the Lord, two parts thereof shall be cut off and die. So this is going to be such a significant time. Two-thirds of the people are going to die. 
and that's what it's telling you. But notice what's the rest of this piece, which is so very interesting. But the third shall be left therein. So a third will be left alive, and those are the ones that flee. And so that's what we're reading about here. And it says, I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is refined. Now, it's talking specifically here about the tribulation. When it refers to fire, it is talking about the third, um, it's talking about the tribulation. And so this is, these people are going to go through the fire and they're going to be refined. And he's going to have a, a huge revival that comes out of this. There's going to be a huge revival that comes up. People who, who go back to their roots, their spiritual roots, and they realize the sins that they have committed and they start absolutely repenting and turning their face back to the Messiah. So let's read this again. This is talking about a revival. And yes, there is going to be a revival, but it's going to, they're going to have to go into the tribulation before they actually can learn their lesson. And so this is what it's talking about here. Verse 9 again, And I will bring a third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. Oh, my goodness. It is a huge revival. Can you imagine one third of all the people in this country now repenting and returning back to the Messiah? That is exactly what we're talking about here. And most of us will probably live to see this. So they're going to go through trials that, that they can't imagine and us either. And they're going to repent and they're going to be, as the scriptures say, they're going to load themselves. Now let's go. Let's go and read some more about this. Now, Ezekiel chapter 5, which is the story of the barber who takes three piles of hair, and he takes all three piles of hair, and he actually starts talking about each pile of hair. So let's pick up in verse 2. And thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city. Now, the cities are going to be destroyed. It says only one out of ten people will live through the cities. And it says, In the midst of the city, when the day of the siege is fulfilled, and thou shalt take one-third part and smite with a knife, and one-third part shall be scattered to the wind, and thou shalt take thereof a few in number. Now, there's, these are the people that are being saved, and they're saved out of all of this. It says, Take a few in number and bind them in thy skirt. Then take all of them again and cast them in the midst of the fire and shall a fire come up on all the house of Israel. So this is talking about all of the house of Israel. This would include, I believe, Judah. Now let's look at verse 10. Therefore thou execute judgment in them and I will, the whole remnant of these will I scatter through the winds. Now let's look at verse 12. And a third part of these shall die with famine and pestilence and shall be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third to the wind and I will draw a sword after them. So they're being chased. So a third die by famine and pestilence. A third die by war. And then a third escape and they're being chased. Now let's read. Chapter 6, verse 8, Yet I will leave a remnant that you may have some that escape the sword among the nations. And when you be scattered throughout the countries, that's your exodus, that's your captivity, you're scattered throughout the nations, and they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations when they have be, been carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish hearts which have departed from me with their eyes, which go whoring after their idols. And they shall loathe themselves for the evil which they have committed and all their abominations. Now that tells it exactly how it is. This prophecy has never been fulfilled before. It's going to be fulfilled at the end time, and it's going to be fulfilled for the land Israel. And that is the many Christian nations we have today. And it's also going to include 
the tribe of Judah. It plainly tells you that in verses 4 through 6 in chapter 5. Now it's talking about in general all of these people and it says Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 12 of he that is far off shall die of pestilence and he that is near shall die by the sword and he that re remaineth is besieged shall die by famine. Notice the next chapter, which is ver chapter 7, and let's read verse 16. And they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valley, and all of them mourning every one for his iniquity. Now, is he telling us here that we need to escape to the mountains? This is something we have to consider. Very, very crucial and important verse. So now what is the time frame for all of this? Because we want to look at that time frame. Let's go to Jeremiah 6 now. Now if you remember the story of the Messiah that, you know, in 4, 2 to 4 BC, you had the heavenly signs which occurred, which was called the store of Bethlehem. And it actually was two planets very close together and it gave off this huge glow of a star and this is the star that the magi saw and we know that story we know that during that time the magi came to Herod and asked where the baby was because they saw his star in the sky so I believe that sometime after 2 BC the Messiah was probably born he was probably born in the fall of 2 BC. And then Herod would die a year later because he died in the year, we believe, of 1 BC. And Josephus records that he died in the year of a major eclipse and that there was two eclipses. One was the one in 1 BC and one is 4 BC. Four would be way too early because the Messiah would not have been born by that time. So now if you count forward, 30 years, then you come to the year 28 AD. And in the springtime of that year, he came to his mother and, his, and he said, she asked him to change the water to wine. And he said, woman, it's my, not my time yet, meaning he wasn't quite 30 years old. Now we know that because in the next thing that he does is he goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And it says he was about 30 years old. He was not 30 years old yet. So the scripture is letting know that he was almost 30 at the point of, at that point when he was baptized. Now he goes into the synagogue and then he starts reading Isaiah 61. Now let's pick up on Isaiah 61. And this is what the Messiah read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek and has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prisons to them that are bound and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So now he's saying some interesting things here. He's saying that he's going to let the captives go free. It is a time of jubilee. It is a time of liberty. And that had to be a jubilee year. So if we're looking at this and, and, it, and if you read the verses, now after the Messiah read Isaiah 61, he closed the book and he said, this is fulfilled in your ears today. So he's saying to the people that he was 30 years old at that point that would qualify him to be the after the order of Mount Cassetic because you had to be 30 years old to be a high priest and so he's telling them at that point I am old enough I am high priest and he was also king remember he came from the line of Judah so he was high priest and he was king and at that point in his life, he could start fulfilling Isaiah 61. And he's also declaring that that year was a year of freedom and liberty for the captives, which means 28 AD had to be a jubilee year. 
I hope everybody sees that because I think that is an absolute critical point. He's given liberty to the captives. That couldn't be any other year but a jubilee year. And it's also the year that he's starting his ministry. All of that fits. All of it ties together. It makes perfect sense. Now, if you count forward in history, you're going to find some very interesting things. You're going to find that if you're using 28 AD as your marker for a jubilee year, many interesting things happen. In 1000 AD, you have Eric the Red that comes to America, and America is founded by the Vikings in 1000 BC. That is a sabbatical year. So now let's talk about other things that fall on this Jubilee calendar. This seven-year cycle should also, it should also tell you what year the Jubilee cycle was. Now, if you're using that calendar, then we have many, many things that pop up, okay? Using that calendar, so 1602 would have, would have been a sabbatical year. That would have been when the explorer Gosnall came. He was the first European to come to, to America. And then we come down to 1623. That was the Treaty of Paris. And that would have been a sabbatical year. I'm just hitting some high points on some of these years. And then we come down to uh, 1742 would have been the year of the Great Awakening in this country. That would have been on a sabbatical year. You had the Boston Massacre occurring on 1770, which would have been uh, a uh, sabbatical year. You had the American Revolution ending the same year. You had 1803, the Louisiana Purchase occurred. That would have been on a sabbatical year. 1812, you would have had the War of the 1812 starting. That would have started in a sabbatical year. Now, the Civil War starts in 1861. That would have been a sabbatical year. Seven years later, the 14th Amendment is adopted, which gives freedom to the, the slaves in this country. Then seven years after that, you had the U.S. Congress pass the Civil Rights Act. Then the next seven years, there is a, a bill put in place for immigration to control some of the immigrants coming into the country. Seven years after that, you have four states being added to the, the Union. That was North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington. It goes on and on and on. Now we get to the 1900s and 1917 would be another sabbatical year and that would have been a jubilee year the following year world war one ends in 1917. now 1945 world war ii ends and that is also a sabbatical year i'm, I'm just hitting the high points here I mean, there's many other things that we can cover on these sabbatical years. But now we get to the year of 2001, which we all know was when the Taurus fell. That was not only a sabbatical year, the next year would have been a jubilee year. So these are interesting dates that pop up when we start looking at this time frame that we're calling the 28th AD as a jubilee year. And I think it's a logical way to think about this. Now, if you look at 2015, 2000, the year of 2015 was also a sabbatical year, which means this year would be the first year in another seven-year period. Does everybody see that? 2015 was marked by blood moons that happened on holy days. And so does that set a marker for what's coming down in the next seven years. Only time will tell, you know, because your Heavenly Father could add time because your Heavenly Father is the only one that knows the time frame, but we know the signs of the times. And if we're using 28 AD as a Jubilee year, then 2015 would have been the end of a seven-year period. 
And like I mentioned, the fall of the Twin Towers occurred in a sabbatical year. So significant time markers are set, are being set, and we're not aware because we're not aware of God's time frame and how he's measuring time. It makes perfect sense to me that the Messiah would have began his ministry in a jubilee year. Now, the other time frame we want to talk about is Jeremiah 6, and so let's go there. We're going to start in verse 1. Now, look at the latter part of this verse. It says, For the evil appears out of the north and a great destruction. And I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. That's talking about the church. And the sheep and the shepherds and their flocks shall come unto her, and they shall pitch their tents round about her, and they shall feed everyone in his place. Now look at verse 4. It says, Prepare ye war against her. Arise, and let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goes away, and for the stretching of the evenings are stretched out. So somehow these people start preparing for this war at noon. Now, and it says that the evening stretches out from noon. And it's talking about a time of day. So if we were talking about a, a year being a day, then we would talk about the spring equinox being at sunrise. We would have summer solstice at noon. We would have the autumn or fall equinox being at sunset. And then from that point through to the next month, when you have very still have quite a bit of light in the sky, you would have the twilight period. And then, of course, the winter solstice would represent what? It would represent the winter time. And that we know occurs around December 21st. Okay, so now understanding how a year relates to a day, then we can go back and look at these prophecies. When it's talking about noon, they start preparing this war at noon, which is in the summer. Now look at verse 5, and it says, Arise and let us go up by night, and shall let us destroy her palaces. Now, it's talking specifically here, night being winter. So sometime there, during the winter month, this army, this mighty army with many nations comes, comes against the land of Israel, at least the ten tribes. Now it's telling you, let's drop down now to verse 17. It says, I will set a watchman over you. That means more than one. Hearken to the sound of the trumpet, for they say we will not hearken. And therefore hear you nations and know, O congregation, what is among you. All right, so there's going to be a warning that goes out, but the people are not going to hear. And that's what it's telling you, that there's going to be some watchmen, but they're not going to hear them. Dropping down to verse 22, and it says that, Thus said the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the northern country. A great nation shall from rise up from the sides of the earth. This is many countries coming together. And so it's, again, talking about the northern country. That's how we know that this prophecy in Jeremiah has to do with Ezekiel 38 that we just read because it's talking specifically about this army that comes up from the northern part or the northern country. Does everybody see that? In verse 23, it says, And they ride upon horses and set array as men of war against the O daughter of Zion. That's another name for Israel. So it's the descendants of Israel. It says these, this nation, this mighty nation that comes on the northern parts, they come as a army. It says at that time, it says verse 26, O daughter of my people, gird thee with a sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for a only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come on us. These people are coming to spoil this nation. They're coming to take goods, and it actually tells you they part the land. They're going to divide it up. 
Let's read verse 16 because it says, And thus said the Lord, Stand you in the paths and see and ask for the old paths. In other words, go find the old ways. Go find not the modern thought for today, but go and find the ancient paths. And that's what we need to follow is the ancient paths. It's, this is his instruction to the people. Go follow the ancient path. And the ancient path we know is what the Israelites did when they were in the land of, of Cana, the land of Israel and the land of Judah. Now, at this point, when the, when the armies have come in, it's too late to pray for God's intervention from that point because he said he's not going to turn back. And let's read that. Let's read chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, Pray not thou for this people, neither lift up or cry or pray for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear. And so once this is in play, he's not going to hear our prayers to, to forgive this nation. So this is our time. This is the time that we have to help our neighbors and our friends and our family understand these prophecies and understand what's coming down for them because the Bible is very direct about who is going to be going into captivity and it's not going to be a pleasant time but he does tell you that the people that go into the tribulation he's going to refine them and he's going to purge them like silver and so it's a spiritual renewal that's coming it is a spiritual revival that's coming for these people. There's no doubt that that's what's going to happen. Okay, now let's go to Jeremiah 16. And let's pick up and start on verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13 in Jeremiah. So, therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that you know not, neither you or your fathers, and there shall serve other gods day and night. I will not show you favor. Therefore, behold, the day comes, said the Lord, that it shall be no more said, the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, from all the lands where he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their own land that I gave unto their fathers. Now this is talking about an exodus, but it happens after. Do you all see that it's happening after they go into captivity? It says after they go into captivity again the second time. So he's telling them the first time, we're not even going to talk about the first exodus where they went into the land of Cana because the second exodus is going to be so much greater. And that's the great and numberable multitude that's mentioned in the book of Revelations that have washed their clothes, they've become clean, they washed their clothes, and now they are repentant. This is a huge revival we're talking about. This exodus is going to be so great that they're not even going to talk about the exodus that went into Egypt. In other words, don't tell us about the exodus that happened when the Israelites went into Cana. Tell us about when you lived at the end time and you went into captivity. Tell us about that time. That's what it's saying. And verse 16, And behold, I will send many fishers, said the Lord, and they shall fish for them. After will I send them many hunters, and they shall hunt for them from every mountain and from every hill and out of every hole in the rocks. Now, the people are going to be hid, and it says they're going to hide in the mountains and in the rocks, and the holes of the earth would be caves. Now, look at verse 19, and the Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The day of affliction is this tribulation. It says the Gentiles, this means the people that are not converted at that point, they shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanities, and things therein there is no profit. So they're in a repentant state. So there is this huge revival coming, but there's going to have to be many things that play out and many miracles that play out before that happens. Now, I just want to touch on this before we close this program, and there are 
some prophecies that pertain to the land of Israel and the Middle East. And this king of the north comes in and he plays the role of Nebuchadnezzar who was the Babylonian king that came in and took down not only Israel, but the entire area in the Middle East. And so this king of the north is going to play that role. He's going to come in again, just like the king of Nebuchadnezzar did in 585 BC when Jerusalem fell. Now, there's also some specific prophecies for Judah, and that we find in Daniel 11 starting at verse 40. So it tells you in verse 40, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now one of those countries he goes into is the land of Cana or the land of Israel today. I looked at that in verse 41, and he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many nations shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, Edom and Moab. So whoever this king of the north is, he's playing the role of Nebuchadnezzar, who it was the king of Babylon. Now we're going to cover that in more detail in another future program. Now with that, we want to close for the evening, and we're going to ask everyone to listen to Hebrew Nation Radio. And I also now have a YouTube site. It's a YouTube link. You can go out on my webpage, which is 12 Tribe History, and get the link for my YouTube page. And in most of those programs are uncut versions. The YouTube channel is called Who is America? So with that, we're going to close for the evening, and we're going to say blessings to all, and good night. Thank <laughs> you.